Okay, well, good morning. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. If you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll pick up where we left off last week. Actually, we'll back up and read chapter, or verses 16 through the end of the chapter, um, and then consider uh, more about God's prophetic word. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And Peter said this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, and we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him, on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray and then we'll consider this portion of scripture. Father, we again thank you so much that we can gather today, have some fellowship, be edified by your word. I pray today that as we discuss your word and the truth of it and the source of it that is from you and not man, that we will understand that every word in there is true and errant and worth paying attention to. So Lord, as we uh, discuss this today, I pray that I will speak clearly um, and that we will all be edified by your word. In your son's name, amen. The prophetic word. I remember this back up the audience. We always, when we consider a section of scripture, we gotta go to the context. Where is it from? So a little review there, Uh, Peter is speaking to this audience, which is believers, believers that have been um, exiled or they've been separated, they've been moved, they've been displaced from where they were, undergoing persecution, uh, not only physical persecution, but mental persecution as far as ridicule for their faith and things like that. They were being exposed to false teachings. Um, So Peter addresses that in the next chapter, which we'll pick up next week. And false teachings come from false teachers, right? False teachers teach from not the word of God, but they teach from a human wisdom. They teach from a man's wisdom or what's worse yet, a demon doctrine, a doctrine that was given them by demons. And they themselves may be deceived by that, but certainly what they're doing is they're deceiving others through their false teachings. Peter's teachings, as he described last week or in verses 16, were not cleverly devised myths. They were not um, man's ideas. They were, the source of it was from God. And that's what we talked about last week as well. Peter then told us last week that he was an eyewitness uh, not to the teachings, to the Lord's majesty. Not only was he an eyewitness to the Lord's life, his teachings, his perfect life, his, his miracles that he did while he walked the earth, his, uh, his death and resurrection that he had predicted beforehand, his ascension, he, he witnessed, witnessed that. But he and James and John also witnessed that glory that will be manifested when he returned, that glory that they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, that glory that, that was difficult to describe, but best was a, a light uh, shining through, just a light that, that human words really can't describe. But we kind of get the idea about what he's talking about. That was just a glimpse of what he will be when he returns. And so therefore, Peter's not teaching something he made up, um, not coming from a human wisdom, but from God. And therefore, every word is truthful. And that's what he said there in verse 16. He agrees with Paul. Okay, Paul, the other apostles, he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, uh, Paul said this, but we, speaking of him and all the apostles that wrote down the New Testament. It says, we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways as we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. They're not going to change God's word. 
uh, and they're not going to make up cleverly devised myths in order to get someone to follow them, as the false teachers would do. But, continuing in 2 Corinthians, by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul knew that God knew every word he said, saw everything he did, and so he will tell the truth, as did all the other apostles. False teachers were not bound to that um, idea or that, that uh, commitment. So Peter and all the human authors of the Old and the New Testaments received their word directly from God. That's what separates them from a true apostle or a true teacher or a true prophet to a false teacher or a false apostle, false prophet. 2 Timothy 3.16, we know this verse well. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So since the Bible is the word of God, <clears throat> And his revelation directly to us through the, to direct his revelation to man uh, through human authors, that's what the Bible is, it and only it can make claims that the Bible, that no other book can make. It is a one of a kind book because it is the only book that is the true word coming from God. And so some of the claims it makes within it, Psalm 19, we, we love this song as well. The psalmist says this about the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So just in that one psalm, the psalmist under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says that the law and the word of God is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, righteous altogether, and enduring forever. No other book can make that claim. Romans 7, 12, Paul says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Psalm 119, 160. Psalm says, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The Lord himself said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, your word is truth. John 10, 35, he said this, scripture cannot be broken. All scripture goes together. All scripture fits together. There's not anything that doesn't fit with what's coming next. The prophets in the Old Testament prophesied some of those prophe prophecies came through during their lifetime. Some did not. Other prophets prophesied. They all point to the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And then Jesus comes and fulfills all the prophecies. There, it cannot be broken. It is a, it is a line. It is a, it is a wire made of titanium that can't be broken. They have more than titanium, I'd say that. Um, in John 3.33, John the Baptist said this concerning Christ the Messiah that whoever receives his testimony, speaking of Jesus' testimony, sets his seal to this, God is true. God is true. And in 1 John, John tells us this, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in, this, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Hebrews tells us it's impossible for God to lie. So everything in there is true. In Matthew 5, 18, the Lord said this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. It is true. It will not be broken. It will, it will endure until every word in there is accomplished. So Peter in this passage, he's just making known that the truth of God's words to these believers, he's encouraging them in them, he's reminding them over and over again so that when he's not with them anymore after his departure, he, they will be able to recall these things. And it's important that they, that they be able to know the truth because by knowing the truth, you can identify with false. So false teachers are part of the uh, issue that Peter's addressing here is part of the issue today as well. But you need to know the truth 
And not merely knowing it, not merely knowing it, you need to embrace it. You need to understand it. You need to place it in your heart. You need to have the sense of it in your mind and apply it to everything you do, every walk in life. That's the idea. That's what the Bible teaches us. And it is true in its entirety. So last week we raised a question, though, when Peter was talking about what he did. Um, how did we know what Peter was telling us was true? Okay, well, he, he kind of gave us some reasons for that. Number one, he was an eyewitness. Okay, he saw, he saw him, Jesus walk the earth, do miracles, teach people, die, resurrected, ascension. He saw him in his glory uh, on the mountain. And that was Peter's experience. That was an experience that Peter had. On the mountain, James and John were there during his life. The other apostles were there, and that was their experience with Jesus Christ. And so Peter says, you can trust what I say because I had firsthand experience. I was there. It wasn't secondhand somebody telling me about it. Um, and I had been telling, teaching them. It seemed that Peter, uh, Peter had been teaching them about Christ's second coming, and the false teachers were denying it. So Peter was kind of saying this in response to that. Um, but he was saying he experienced it. He saw it. He witnessed it with his own eyes. And again, like I said, the, all the apostles witnessed Jesus' life and his teachings and his death and resurrection, the ascension. Uh, Peter and James and John got to get a little more glimpse into his glory on the mountain. But the question is, is Peter's experience what you base your truth on? Is that the standard of truth? Do we have an experience and now we base our truth on that experience? Peter's going to go on to tell there's something more sure than the experience that even Peter had on the mountain. There's something more sure than just having that experience. There's even stronger proof of what he is telling them is true and right and powerful. And that is that his power, everything that he had been teaching them, had been prophesized in the Old Testament prior to it happening. There's something more sure than just me experiencing that, and that is that it was foretold in the Old Testament, written down by the prophets, and it will come true. So he moves into then verse 19. After he tell, after Peter tells about this experience, he heard these words, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He experienced that glory. He says then in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, we, he's talking about all of us. Okay, that's just kind of a general we. We all have the word. And one possible interpretation in the context here is that Peter's saying, well, you know, I just had that experience. Or I didn't just have it, but I had this experience. I saw the Lord. I walked with the Lord. And that experience then more fully confirmed the word that had already been written. One possible explanation for it. Uh, but, but let's see other translations there. The King James translate uh, the prophetic word more fully confirmed. It, it translates it the more sure word of prophecy. And literally it says we have more sure the prophetic word. In other words, we, the prophetic word is more sure than what I just told you. And so he's referring in the prophetic word to the Old Testament scriptures. That's the scriptures that, that they had at that time. And so what he's pointing to is that the Old Testament scriptures pointed to and promised the coming one, the Messiah. Remember, he, a woman uh, born of the seed of a woman, uh, he would bruise the serpent's head. That's way back in Genesis. And then it goes through the law, the Moses, the prophets, Isaiah, all the way through Malachi, including the Psalms. And all of this is more prophetic and more sure of teaching what I've been telling you than what I experienced. It's more sure. In John 5, 9, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He says, and the Pharisees, they, were, they, had, they knew the scriptures back and forth, right? They were the experts in the law. And Jesus says this to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. All those scriptures point to him, point to Jesus. In Acts 17, 11, we should take the, um, uh, what the Bereans did and, and understand that that is a way to do it. He says, uh, now these Jews, you know, Paul had been uh, 
thrown out of a few places for preaching the gospel. When he went to Berea, he's, um, Acts 17 records this, that these Jews here in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. So they're hearing the word of the gospel from Paul that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're going to the scriptures to see if he's lying or not, right? That's their, the scriptures are the sure word of prophecy, the truth. So Peter's saying that even though he was the eyewitness to Christ's glory and, and, and that experience, as awesome as it was, that's not as important as the written scripture that we have. And the reason for that is experiences like Peter's and other human beings, they have that. They're, there's limitations to experiences. If you just go by the experiences and think that is the, the basis of your truth, um, you're going to be led down a wrong path, okay? Paul, as you recall, Paul in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he begins to talk about his thorn in the flesh, remember he was, the reason he was talking about that, he goes, you know, I got to talk about these visions I've had. You know, God had given me these visions, these experiences that no one else had but Paul, right? So they're his experience. Okay, he goes in, in verse 1, it's necessary that I boast it. It says, it's not profitable that I tell you about these visions, but I'll proceed and tell you about it. And then as he goes in verses 2 and 12, he, he, he makes you understand he, he really didn't know what was going on. It was almost incomprehensible to him. He said, I was caught up in the third heaven. I don't know if I was in the body or not in the body. You know, I was in paradise, but I wasn't sure if I was in the body or not the body. You know, I heard things that I said, but they told me I couldn't say things like that. So it was somewhat, this experience that Paul had was somewhat incomprehensible. And that's the way experiences are. Okay, they're un, incomprehensible a lot of times, but they're unverifiable and you, and you can't repeat them. They're not repeat, repeat you know, you can't do them again, I guess, at all because of God. Not saying the experiences weren't true and happened, but they're an experience to that person alone. And the Jews, actually, they took the written word of God more sure than any voice from heaven or anything like that. They preferred the prophecy of the written word to anything that they heard from heaven or any other voice. So the Jews, so he's writing this <clears throat> as well. Uh, Matthew Henry gives this commentary on, on this particular section of Scripture, and I think it, it helps. He says, the Old Testament is a more sure word of prophecy. He says, it is so to the Jews who received it as the oracles of God, which is what it is. The written word of God is the oracles of God coming from God. And so this is how they looked at it. It says, following prophets, this is in the Old Testament, they confirmed what had been delivered by those who went before. And then these prophets had been uh, written by, and, and these prophecies had been written by the express command and preserved by the special care, many of them fulfilled by the wonderful providence of God. So therefore, we're more certain to those who had all along received and read the scriptures than the apostles' account of this voice from heaven. So what he's saying is those that study the scriptures and read it and see what the prophecies are and they point to the next thing, this is more sure than someone's experience that they said to you. And he goes on to say, Moses and the prophets more powerfully persuade than even miracles themselves. So even if you see a miracle, that experience may be validating something, but it's not the sure uh, word that is written in the scriptures. So the written word of scripture is more important than any experience, even miracles, even miracles. Do you recall the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 there? Uh, remember the rich Lazarus was outside the rich man's house and had all these sores on him. Dogs would lick him. He was poor. And he died, and he went to, the, to be with Abraham, the bosom of Abraham. And then the rich man died, and he went into hell. He went into torment, where he was being tormented night and day. And um, the rich man then cried out to Father Abraham and said, send Lazarus over and just give me a little taste of the water to cool my tongue. And he, Abraham said, he can't do that. There's a big chasm between us. We can't go there. You can't go there. Um, and then he said, but then um, send Lazarus back to my house, to my family. I got five brothers here. 
Okay, and they're probably in the same spiritual shape that rich man was. So he goes, if you send Lazarus back there to my house, they'll repent and believe. And Abraham replied then there, he says, um, Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the word, okay? Let them hear, let them, hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. He said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. They are asking for a miracle. He was asking for a miracle to go back to his brothers. But he said, no, they've got Moses in it. They've got the written word. They will repent from that. That is more sure. So in Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus said, all the prophets and the, for all the prophets and the law prophesies until John. Everything from Genesis all the way up to John the Baptist, John the Baptist being the last Old Testament prophet, right? Uh, therefore, the Old Testament is prophecy. And then after John in the New Testament was written, that is the history of that prophecy being fulfilled. All right? Okay. Matthew Henry, again, another quote from him. I got a lot on him today because I thought he was pretty good. Um, he said, the evangelists and the apostles, that would be the New Testament authors, have written the history of what was before delivered as prophecy in the Old Testament, right? It says, now the accomplishment of the Old Testament by the New and the agreeableness of the New Testament in the Old, how they, no scripture can be broken, they all agree, says, are a full demonstration of the truth of both of them. Awesome idea to think about. And so then Peter now comes and says, um, in verse 19, the second half of that, he says, okay, we've got this more sure word, this, this prophetic word, to which you would do well if you paid attention to it, right? As a lamp shining in a dark place. Um, do well if you pay attention. I mean, take heed, apply it, read it, understand it, get the sense of it, uh, apply it to your, to, your, uh, to your life and everything. Your hearts believe it. Uh, and allow yourself to be molded and fashioned by what the word says. Um, in Nehemiah 8, I mean, Nehemiah, <laughs> Nehemiah 8, 8, when you, as you recall, when the exiles came back and they, they, got, they found the word of law and they read it, they said in, in this, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says, and they read from the book of the law clearly, this isn't on your handout, so don't look for it. They read from the book of the law clearly, and they gave the sense of it. They understood it, okay? So that the people understood in the reading. So when we read it, we don't just read it. We want to get the sense of it. We want to understand what it's saying. We want to do well to pay attention to it, right? And this understanding, why do we, do, why do we want to do that? Because this understanding um, keeps us from being tossed by every wind of doctrine. It keeps us understanding what is true and what is false. And we can spot that and understand it. And so by doing well, by paying attention, it guides our thoughts, it guides our words, it guides our intentions, it guides our action, it really just guides our whole life. Need to pay attention to it. Then he gives a simple metaphor as a lamp shining in a dark place. We, we understand, we get the, the picture of that as well. And this metaphor can kind of be applied in two ways here. Let me just give you those, okay? The word, when we read it and understand it and get the sense of it, is this light that shines into our darkened soul. Okay, it is the one that, that our, fallen, our fallen soul then, through the work of the Holy Spirit, convicts us of the sinfulness, and it becomes light to us now. We're all familiar with Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's the, the word is described as light and lamp because in a dark world, and even in our dark heart, it guides us into what we should do and where we should go. Proverbs 6.33 describes it as a lamp and light. also says, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are a way of life. So the word is a lamp, a light. It disciplines us. And it disciplines us in the way we should go. Ephesians 5 8, Paul said, For one time you were in darkness, okay, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk <laughs> as children of light. 
You're not children of darkness anymore. So we may be making the metaphor to that, that, that this light, this, this, this word, this, this uh, prophetic word, the divine word that we have shines into you as a light, and now we follow that light, right? And, and we, it's, it's a light that shines into the darkness of our heart. But I think he, in the context, he, it's more the number two there that I said. It says we do well if we pay attention, uh, and then we become the lamp into the world. Okay, Jesus, we know, is a true light. Okay, um, John eight twelve there he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We know Jesus is a light. Uh, John 1, 5, uh, John speaking of, of Christ when he came to earth, he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Yes, we are now the light imperfectly. Probably think of it as a reflection of the light of Christ, okay? But we are now the light in a dark world, a dark world. Luke eight sixteen. what do we do with that light? Well, no one after lighting a lamp covers it in a jar and puts it under the bed, right? <laughs> um, he puts it on a stand so that all may see that light, right? And in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, um, Paul said, you know, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown into our hearts to give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we, as as we pay attention to the, word, to the word, as the Holy Spirit convicts us, and we now become the reflections of the light of Christ, we now go into this dark world and shine like we are supposed to shine. Imperfectly, but we do shine. That light is inside us. And so how long then do we shine? Well, 19C there. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. What's he mean by that, too? That's a little poetic kind of way of saying some things. Um, so this day that's dawning, is that like an actual day or a spiritual day? Something spiritual takes place in your heart? Well, again, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, Matthew Henry believes he's speaking of the, a spiritual day. And I'll just read you his thing, and it's written in Matthew Henry language, so I may have to explain some of it. Um, this enlightening, this light in a dark place, this enlightening of a dark, benighted mind. I guess our mind is in darkness and benighted. I guess that's an old English way of saying it. It's like the daybreak that improves and advances and spreads and diffuses itself through the whole soul. So when we are um, enlightened by the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's like the dawn breaking. And at dawn, after dawn, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, right? That's what he's saying there. Uh, shines brighter and brighter until a full day. Um, Proverbs 4.18 said, uh, But the path of the righteousness is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until a full day. We understand that the light that is placed there we should grow inside a true believing Christian. Then Matthew Henry describes it one more time. This, this light inside us now, this, this day that dawns inside us, is a growing knowledge uh, to those who are in this way enlightened, okay? And they, this, is what they, this is how they act. They never think they know enough about the Scripture, right? Until they come to know as they are known by God. So if this is a spiritual day he's talking about, this light that, 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 that he's talking about, the morning star that's rising in our heart is the light of Christ that, that just continues to light uh, more and more and more. In other words, being sanctified, becoming more and more like Christ and understanding what, what he said and what, what we should do. Or is he talking about this day dawning being a physical day? Is it an actual day, the day of his return? Okay, the, 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 the topic had been actually about the power and coming of Jesus. That's what, what Paul, I mean, that's what Peter had been teaching. And that's probably what the false teachers were accusing him of making up this coming back of Jesus. So maybe he's talking about the physical day of, of Christ's return. Uh, we know what that'll be like. It's described several places in Matthew 24. 
There will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes on earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And in Revelation 19, you know, when he returns, he comes in power. When he came the first time, he came in his humiliation. He allowed them to kill him, etc. So when he comes, it won't be anything like that. He'll return, as it talks about in Revelation um, uh, 19, about on his horse, uh, king of kings, lord of lords, written on his robe and his thigh. So he's going to come in power, and he's going he's to come in all righteousness, and he will destroy wickedness at that time. So that's really the, the climax, obviously, of our salvation experience. Uh, but it's also kind of bittersweet because it's also the judgment of the wicked. Uh, we will mourn for those that we know who are not saved. So it will be bittersweet to us. So the word morning star, Jesus sometimes referred to morning star in a couple other places, but that word literally mean, in Greek is phosphorus. You've heard that word in, in uh, English, but literally it means light bringer, someone who brings light. And it was a name given to Venus uh, by the Greeks because Venus was the last star in the morning before the sun arose. It was a light bringer. It's bringing the light of day now. That was the reason it was talked to. So in the context of this second coming, the, the morning star, the light bringer, is Jesus, right? It's Christ coming there. We understand that. And that, like I said earlier, we're, we're reflections of his light. We're little lights now, but imperfectly because of that remaining sin. But when Christ returns, that light will become brighter and brighter and brighter. That light in us will become the, what we're longing for, to be like him, okay? In 1 John 3, 2, you know, we're God's children now, but when he returns, okay, what? Uh, we know that we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. So that light is, will be exponentially increased and become perfected during that time when Christ returns. So in our hearts, that light is, is rising more and more. I don't know how many of y'all saw Independence Day, the first one. I think that's pretty old now, but you remember when they had, they had the uh, alien ship was crashed on Earth and it, it was dead. They had the wreckage of it, but it didn't do anything. But then when the mother ship arrived, what happened? All the gizmos started working. The light came on inside there, and it started working. That, that's kind of the way I, that's probably a bad analogy, but that's kind of the way I, I, I kind of look at this. When he comes back, that light's going to come on even more and more. Bad analogy. Because we know in Romans, that Paul tells us in Romans, uh, that we are predestined to be conformed to his image. We will become like him, and that will be when he returns. But then Peter in verse 20 says, before you pay this attention, pay this close attention to the scripture. You got to know something first. Verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So it's absolutely necessary before we pay attention to scripture to, scripture, to, to, uh, to know that this prophetic word, that this scripture is true and divine in origin. Scripture is of divine origin. Scripture, it says, first of all, it says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from, that word comes from, there's genomai, which means comes into being or originates. No Scripture comes into being or originates. That word's used in John 1, 3, which I didn't write down also. It's translated the word made there, and listen to this, all things were made through him. All things came into being, originated through him. And without him was not a thing made, or did nothing come into being, that was made, that came into being. He's three times in one sentence, uh, signifying that it originated in Christ. So in this, in this sentence here, he said, no scripture originated from someone's own interpretation. So no scripture is man's private interpretation or opinion or inclination or original thoughts, but a direct revelation from God. That's what we need to understand about Scripture. 
And that was the difference between, in the Old Testament, true prophets and false prophets. Remember, true prophets are the ones that, that spoke as thus says the Lord, came to them, and it was a direct revelation from the Lord. It was not their own words. Um, Moses, obviously, was one of those. And, and when the people rebelled in, in the rebellion of Korah, he, he said this in, in verse um, 28 of chapter 16 of Numbers. He says, uh, hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. This is how you're going to know I'm a true prophet. He goes, and that it has not been my own accord. It was not his own accord that he did any of the miracles that he did, that he wrote down any of the words that he wrote down. It was not his. As you remember how that ended, the Lord certainly validated his, um, his truthfulness. Um, but false prophets, false prophets are, are, are those that... Um, uh, that speak not directly from the Lord, but of their own volition, of their own mind. Um, Deuteronomy 18.22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that's a word the Lord didn't speak. Okay, many false prophets would prophesize things and they would not come true. And if you recall what the punishment for that was, supposed to kill them, supposed to stone them. Jeremiah 23, 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. And that was Jeremiah, the true prophet, who was prophesying the destruction of Israel and, and, and calling them to repentance. But they had many false prophets who were telling them what they wanted to hear. Ah, it's going to be okay. God told me it's going to be okay. Well, it wasn't okay. They, Jeremiah's prophecy came true. And it's because these prophets were prophesizing their own thoughts and their own ideas. Uh, maybe wanted to be a little more popular. Yeah, you know, everything's going to be good. You know, they hear. That word interpretation, uh, epilusis, it, it's an explanation or application, but it, re, it does, it's a, it's, Unfortunate that it says it in there because it makes it kind of confusing, but it actually refers to the source of something and not just the understanding of something. So when he says no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, he could have said it from someone's own thoughts, ideas, things like that. It's the source. It doesn't come from within him. So questions. How important is it to know the scripture is divine in origin? How important is it to know? How important is it to know that what you're reading is God's word and not man's word? Uh, that's contained in them is not a man's mind or a man's made up, but God's mind. Well, think of this. If they originate in man's mind, they're going to have, they're going to be fallible. They're going to have error in them. But because they originate in God's mind, infallible, without error. Perfect, right? They we should pay attention to that and understand it completely because of the source of them, what they came from. And if it came from a man and I'm reading them, I'm sure I could come up with a better way to do it, right? If it comes from God, hmm, I need to learn from what he wrote down. So we don't question the scriptures. If we're questioning the scriptures, we're saying, well, a man wrote that. It didn't really come from God. I think I could do it better than that. If it comes from God, we would do well to pay attention to it, right? So Peter then tells us, kind of concludes there by telling us how those scriptures were produced. And this is a verse that we, you've heard many times, and it's one of those, one of those like events, like the transfiguration, a supernatural event that they write it down but you really don't know exactly how it all took place, right? I mean, you kind of have speculations and things, but it's one of those events that's hard to put into words. Um, verse 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy, not a, not a single word, not a single sentence, not a single thought that was in there in Scripture came from someone's, from the will of man, from someone, from a man's mind. Produced, meaning made or originated, no scripture ever uh, was brought into being by a man's own 
thoughts, desires, etc. That's what the will of man means. Human will, human thought, human ideas, human desires, human wants. These scriptures did not come from that. They are akin to salvation. It's all of God. They are all from God. Remember John 1.12? But for all that did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh. So it wasn't their human descent that made them a child of God coming from Abraham, nor was it anything they did, the will of the flesh, anything they worked for, nor of the will of man, nor was it any idea that originated inside them. But it's of God. It came from God. That's where our salvation comes from. He is all in all. So no prophecy of scripture, Peter says here, uh, was produced or originated in man, but, that word Allah, I like that, Allah, but it means just the opposite. And on contrary, quite the contrary to what I just said. And then, he, then I gave you a few other translations there. They're very similar, but just listen to them. But men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. The King James says, but holy men spake, at, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The literal says, but men spoke from God being brought by the Holy Spirit. Now, they're all kind of similar. They all obviously have the same idea behind them, but the commonality between all of them is I underlined there. In all the translations, God is the active agent. God is the supreme agent. God is the one that gives us the, the ability to do that, and men are just God's instruments. So all word, all word came from God. Matthew Henry describes it. How, how that took place, you know, you always wonder about that. I mean, did, did when these writers were writing it, did the Holy Spirit come and take their arm and kind of make them do that? You know, did it, you know, did he whisper in their ear, this is what you write down? You know, hard to say. Matthew Henry, and this kind of pretty good, I think, idea uh, of how it took place. Number one, the Holy Ghost inspired and dictated to them what they were to deliver of the mind of God. Gave the mind of God to, these, to the writers of, the, of Scripture. And then number two, he powerfully excited and effectually engaged them to speak or write. In other words, he, he empowered them to do it, gave them the strength to do it, um, at what, he had put, what he just told them, what he had put into their mouth. And number three, I like this, and then he so wisely and carefully assisted and directed them in the delivery of what they had received from him, that they were effectually secured from any the least mistake in expressing what was revealed to them, so that the very words of Scripture are to be accounted as the words of the Holy Ghost. Kind of like that. Donnie MacArthur said a little clear, a little bit maybe more vague. He says, for Peter, it was as if the writers of scriptures raised their spiritual sails and allowed the Spirit to fill them with his powerful breath of revelation as they penned the divine words. That's kind of a little more poetic. I like specifics as well. And Luke Wynn said, all in all, though, uh, Luke tells us that he, God, spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from, the, from, from of old. And then that scripture there, we get, need to, this is a 316 that we need to remember even more. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. A scripture is only profitable if it comes from God. It's only profitable if it is divine in origin. And so we should, we would do well to pay attention to it. Okay, let's pray. Father, again, thank you so much for your written word. As, we, as you have told us in this passage today, it is from you. It is perfectly comes from you. Although written by human authors, dear Lord, we know that it is your word, direct and true. So, Lord, give us the strength, uh, give us the desire to pay attention closely to it and apply it to our lives. Take heed. In your son's name we pray. Amen.